all of a sudden I got nervous. And usually when I say that out loud, it loses its power. So I'm going to voice it out loud. So I was um, just praying for the gathering. I've known about the gathering for a while now. For I think you guys have been around for about five or six years. Is that right? Five? Five years. And so I've known about the gathering for a while, um, since you started, actually. And the way that I've known about it is that five years ago, I had a class with Leah. Um, and we were in class together. And we only had one class together. But in that class, we got to know each other pretty well because it was a counseling class. And so we got put together to be each other's um to be each other's partner, to counsel each other. So in that space, we got to be intimate with each other and learn about each other and grow and heal together as well. And um, But also in that time, I got to know your pastor as well, Don. And I always wanted to come here, and I always wanted to be able to give my gratitude to Don for the impact that he's had in my life. And one of the ways that Don impacted my life was when I was in that time with Leah, um, in that class with Leah, I was moving into a place, and I was really stressed out, and um, and that place had some pretty steep steps, and I wasn't sure how we were going to build a ramp. I was kind of in a short notice, and she said, hey, my dad can build a ramp. Why don't I ask my dad if he'll come and build a ramp for you? And Don didn't know me at all, and um, and he came to my house, and he built my ramp. He spent several days on this massive project. This wasn't a small ramp. It wasn't like two steps. It was like five steps. And they were all, they were like five steep steps. So this wasn't a cheap ramp either. And he actually paid for the ramp and he built the ramp. And so I always wanted to be able to give my gratitude to Don. I, I don't do like, hey, thank you very well. Um, I'm a presence person. And so I've never actually spent a lot of time with Don after he built my ramp. And so I feel like this is an extension of my gratitude through presence um, to Don this morning. But it also exemplifies the thing, the very thing that's in my heart and the very thing that I love about the community um, of believers, the very thing I love about the body of Christ. I'm not used to this, so I'll have to get used to this. Um, but the very thing that I love about the body of Christ and what I love about the body of Christ is that it's just that that it's a body, and that it's a family, and that it's pretty powerful when it's done well and done right, and when it's, um, it was God's design, and it's really beautiful. And I love to encourage the body of Christ. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do, to encourage the body of Christ to continue to love, to work through its differences, to um, be honest, um, to love others, all those things is one of my favorite things to do. But what Dawn did for me that day was the thing that I've experienced in my life many times. And it was a space where people were able to fill in my gaps. Um, people were able to come in and help me in a way that would help in some ways bring redemption to my life. Um, I mean, life is filled with struggles, right? I mean, life is filled, I think, to deny that we have struggles would be um, a lie. To deny that we don't live in a world where there's troubles, because John 16, 33 says that in this world we'll have many troubles, but we can take heart because he's overcome the world. And one of the ways that he overcomes the world is through us. One of the ways that he overcomes the world is through the body of Christ. Through um, one of the ways that he redeems our world is through each other. And that's my favorite thing about that even though we have troubles, we can take heart because he's overcome the world. Not only did he overcome it because he died for us and his blood overcomes sin and all those things, but he uses us to be able to be the redemption in the world. Um, and Dawn was a part of that for me through the struggles that I have. Um, Don was able to come and, and make my life easier. And he did it to somebody that he didn't even know. And he came and, and did that for me. So one of my favorite passages is, um, is I never forget the verse, um, the actual. I'm not a detailed person. I'm a big picture person. So details take a lot for me to remember. But one of my favorite passages is in Psalm 68, I hope. 68.6 maybe? 
66 or 68, but I'm pretty sure it's 68. And it says that God sets the lonely in families. Above that, it says that he cares for the fatherless, um, but that he sets the lonely in families. And so that is probably one of the core messages of my life, that God sets the lonely in families. Um, he started that out, right? I mean, God's original design was not for us to ever be alone. His original design was for us to have a beautiful relationship with him and a beautiful relationship with each other. That was his design. His design was in the beginning, he created a world that was perfect. And in the beginning, he created a world where there was no pain. He created a world where there was um, no strife. There was no pride. There was no... Um, broken families. There were no diseases. Um, he created a world that was perfect. And we see what God's heart is when we see what he start, what he began with. We see um, that in the beginning, um, we look and we see the world before the fall. And so we get to see what the heart of God is. And the heart of God is for us and for our good. And we look out and, it's, and, and we see that when he created the world, it was, it was good. When he, he says that he looked over and he, when he created man, it was very good. When he created man and woman, it was very good. So we were very good in the eyes of God. Humanity was very good. He loved it when he created us in his image. He loved it when he breathed his breath of, breath of life in us. This was his pleasure. This was his delight. We are his pleasure. You are his pleasure. He is pleased with us. He loves us. You know the first thing in creation that he looked out and he saw that wasn't good? The first thing that we hear in creation that isn't good is when he looks out and he sees that man's alone. For the first time, he looks over his creation and he says, something's not good. It is not good that man is alone. He had, ha he had created animals. He created all these things that were perfect and good. But there was one thing that wasn't good. It wasn't good for man to be alone. And you know what? It's still not good for man to be alone, for woman to be alone. His heart is not for loneliness. His heart, he created family. He created connection. And in the heart of each one of us is this desire for connection this desire for belonging, and this desire for purpose. Because he created us, we can see in the beginning, he created us for a relationship with him, a relationship with each other, and he created us for purpose, for tasks, to take care of the world. The world that he created that was perfect. We were supposed to take care of it. But somewhere along the lines, Adam and Eve did that thing that they did, they ate the apple or the peach. I made that up. He ate some piece, they ate some piece of fruit and broke everything up. And in that space where they did that, the curse entered into the world of our relationships and in our purpose and in our tasks. So in that moment, everything was broken. And we did that, not God. His design for us is good. And so throughout life, God has been setting up redemption. He has been setting up ways to redeem the brokenness. He's been setting up ways to redeem what has been wronged. Because he makes right what has been wronged. So he's made, he does this. And one of the ways that he does this is through family. Um, I kind of want to touch on just really, I just, I don't know. But I spent many years feeling bad. I, I was single for a lot of years. Um, I didn't get married till I was 36 years old. And I know I don't look that old, but I didn't get married until I was 36. And, um, and I spent a lot of years um, maybe even trying to cover up the fact that I was alone or trying to cover up the fact that I was lonely. I didn't live near my family. Um, and I kind of, I, there was a part of me that felt bad that I desired community. And as a single person, my hope was never, my desire was never to get married. That wasn't like, um, that was going to fill my deepest longing. No, my desire was for community. 
My desire was for community and out of that community to live for purpose and passion in the body of Christ. Because we were designed for, for each other, for God, and for purpose. And so I, I had that deep loneliness in my spirit because I desired community and fellowship, not just with God, but with others as well. And so I don't know if within anyone else there is that desire for deeper connection with God or deeper connection with each other. And I just feel like today it's important to say that that is a design that God gave us. And that we don't have to feel bad about that deeper desire that we have for connection with God or with each other. They say that there's a God-shaped hole inside of us that's, that's for God. But I also believe that there's a God-shaped hole in us for each other as well. And that the way that God redeems the brokenness in our lives is not only through his Holy Spirit, but through each other. And so I'm going to move somewhere with this, I promise. I just feel like I, I want to like just set the tone. This is God's design for us to be set in families. And so we can see that, just looking out over history, we can see that um, God designed community. We can look at the Old Testament, and we can see where God cares about the most. Like, we look and we, we see where he says, to care for the orphan, to care for the widow, to care for the fatherless. That's throughout scripture. That is um, over and over and over again a command, to care for the orphan, the fatherless, and the widow. And oftentimes, to care for the fatherless, the orphan and the widow, we look at those people, and those are the people without families. That's the one thing that they have in common, because God created a community that people would care for each other. And so um, we look and we see that family connection, and those are the people, the orphan, the fatherless, and the widow are the people without family connection. So we see God's heart for that connection there. Um, and in the New Testament, we see, um, we see Jesus, right? We see who did Jesus go toward? Who did Jesus heal? The people that Jesus healed, the people he went toward, who was he drawn to? He was drawn to the people without connection. He was drawn to the leper who never was able to be touched because he was an outcast. He was drawn, drawn, I, the story that stands out to me is a story he's walking and there's this funeral that's going by. And this lady's only son had just died. And he goes and he's moved with compassion because she's crying, because she's lost her only son. Who knows if she was, I think she was a widow. She was a widow who had lost her only son. And he goes over and he raises that, that, that young man from the dead. But he raised it from the, he raised, the thing that stands out to me about the story is that this lady was going to live in isolation but God cared about that for her. Jesus cared about that for her. And he went and raised her son from the dead. That's a powerful story. And not only did that, but he healed the disabled. In that day, and I would venture to say in this day too, I speak it as a disabled person, that, that but in Jesus' time, the disabled were very much on the fringes. They, they were lonely and isolated and definitely were not able to work jobs that they had purpose or anything like that. Jesus was drawn to those people. Those are the people that Jesus healed, were people who were isolated from family, isolated from touch, isolated from community. Jesus went to those people. And then if we look in the New Testament even further with the early church, Acts 2.42 probably gets used a lot for the thought of community and us talking about community, but there were people, they had everything that they needed among them, and they met together daily, and they built community, and people were added to their mix, people were added to their fellowship on a regular basis, and so we see that, and, and I, and I think that, um, I think what God is asking for us, and the thing that I think I'm seeing here, I looked at your web website, and before I even began to speak today, I was praying about what does God want to say to the gathering today? Like, I don't want to presume that I come in. I knew, I don't know you guys, but God does. And so I, I wanted to hear what God wanted to say to you. And what I felt like God wanted to say was that he's pleased with you. You're doing it. You know, like, you're, 
I feel like um, I feel like I feel like there's something really beautiful that God is asking us to do as the body of Christ. And the thing that he's asking us to do is to create a new place of belonging, a new community for people who are on the fringes, to create a new um, thought of family, a new um, a new community that goes just beyond what we know a typical family to be, to create a new space for people, a new type of family giving people something to belong to. And I feel I felt like God was saying that about the gathering church that you guys are doing that. That you're you are giving people something to belong to. And but I when I talk about this, I don't mean cliche community. You know, that's a word that we use a lot. I mean, in the last 10 years, I've heard the word community more times than I'd ever heard it before. Maybe because I was younger or something. But I really think that there's this new phrase that everybody's saying. It's this new community. But oftentimes what I see happening is that just people of like-mindedness getting together and saying they're going to eat together once a week and they're going to do things together. But everybody's alike. And that's what I'm seeing, is these essentially cliques getting together, hanging out, eating together once a week, and we're calling ourselves community. Um, I don't think that's what Jesus meant with Acts 2.42. I whispered that. But I just don't think that's what he meant. He loves it when people from all walks of life come together to share life because we have something to learn from each other. Um. And so I am proposing, not that this is a new proposal, um, but something that's really on my heart, and I just want to thank you for letting me be here to share it, is that there's something about love that is not a weak love. It's a powerful love. And there's something about sacrifice. That those two go together when we think about the concept of bringing people into families. It's about love, and it's about sacrifice. Um, you know, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Um, and that we are to love uh, um, love our neighbor as ourselves. So there's something about loving ourselves in there too, like loving God, loving your neighbor, and loving yourself. Because we can really only love our neighbor as much as we really love ourselves. And that that is really profound because... If we don't, because what I find is if we don't love ourselves, if if we're constantly criticizing ourselves and not receiving the love of God for ourselves, then we're constantly going to be judging other people with the same judgments that we put on ourselves. So that's just a tidbit in there um, about love. So, um, So those are the things that I was thinking about. And then how it says that it, we are supposed to pursue love as our highest calling. Um, and that people will know that we're Christians by our love. And so, and then love taking sacrifice. I was, I was reading 1 John 3, 14 through 17, where it says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees his brother or sister in need and shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other, but let us show the truth by our actions. 1 John three fourteen through 17. And so, I believe that the greatest need is not, we don't need another food bank and I don't think that we need more free meals and I, our society is different than what it used to be our society we live in America and in Lexington this is a true story you guys should probably know this if there is a person on the side of the street asking for food there is a place that somebody can get a meal every day of the week, lunch and dinner. I'm, I'm calculating in my head make sure I say this right. But there is a place that somebody can go in Lexington for lunch or dinner for every meal, including Sunday. Sunday is a harder day for dinner, but there's a place on Sunday afternoons that they can go to. So food is not a need. 
There are lots of clothing banks. Clothing is not a need. There are places for people to get their rent and electricity paid. One of the needs probably is furniture. You know, like I'm thinking back, you know, I work at the rescue mission. Some of the needs are furniture. There are needs that people have. But the greatest poverty that people have is isolation and loneliness. That is our greatest need. That is the greatest poverty is people in isolation and loneliness. And it's, it's tricky to take people who um, from all walks of life and put them together because you have sometimes a little bit of craziness going on, you know? I mean, seriously, it gets a little complicated and it gets a lot messy. Um, and so um, this is something that I think is vital and really important um, for the body of Christ for us to come together. I'm passionate about this probably because God set me a lonely person in the body of Christ in a family. And I'm passionate about this because every day I see lonely people come in who need families. And really that's the answer is family. The answer is God's love, but they will never, they may never experience God's love if the body of Christ doesn't show them God's love. And God's love is powerful. I think we've all experienced in this space. God's love is powerful, and it has the power to redeem us. But people may not ever know that redemption if we're not that love. Every day I see people come in that are on the fringes, that live in society as um, people with mental illnesses. Um, I have a friend who right now is in the hospital, and he's a Vietnam vet, and he's been homeless probably for the last year living in his truck because people take advantage of him. He makes enough money to live in an apartment, but he's afraid to live in an apartment because he's not safe. And so there isn't safe housing for him. And so right now, he lives a very, all he wants, he says out loud. He comes to our community on Wednesday nights called Steady Hands, and every week he says, this is the way I see it. He's got He's a really little man. And he says, it takes three people for me to be better. It takes the man upstairs, God. I try to tell him God's here with us. But the man upstairs, God, it takes me. And it takes that third person. And he emphasizes that really, really a lot because he's very angry. He doesn't have that third person. And if I don't have that third person, then I'm going to go straight to hell. And I hear that in him. This is a man who lives in his truck. This is a man who just got robbed a couple days ago because he was sleeping in his truck. And in that, in somebody robbing him, they a piece of metal went into his skin, and so it got infected. And um, and he had now he's in the hospital. He's going to be there for about a month. Um, I mean. I don't know what the answer is for him. All I have is this compelling feeling that he needs to be set in a family. And setting him in a family is complicated. And it's not easy. But we have to get a little messy in order for that to happen. It, it's Love is messy. Sacrifice is messy. It's not easy to take someone who has... Um, who is socially unacceptable, who curses in public and does things that are just embarrassing in public to set them in a family. But every week at the rescue mission, we try to do that, set them in a family. Um, and we create structures for that to happen, for them to come every week and be themselves and it, and, and it takes people from all, all walks of life for that to happen. I have, I have this theory that for, um, you know, we're all at different growth levels, right? I mean, yeah, we are. And so we're all at different maturity levels. And so I think it takes about four mature people to eight, this is just my theory, to eight kind of immature growing in healthiness emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Um, and I think it has to be a level 
balance for us to grow together. Um, but I believe it is possible for us to grow and to set them in families. And I feel like God wants to encourage you that you have that structure and that it's happening here. And so, um, because in order to invite anybody into our family, we ourselves have to be healthy. Um, and, and so I just want to encourage you guys as you continue to go in your journey. Um, and, 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 um, yeah. So I'm going to leave, going to leave us today with Second Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to find it. Second Corinthians 5.14. It says, Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those... Let me see if I can see this better. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this tax task of reconciling people to him for God was it God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them and he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation so we are we are Christ's ambassadors God is making his appeal through us we speak for Christ when we plead come back to God for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering of our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. I'm just going to. So we live in a broken world. There's no doubt about that. And one of the ways that God redeems our world is through each other. Um, and I believe that God's redemption, God's love is God's redemption in the world. And so I just, I don't know what that means for us here at the gathering this morning, but something that I'm really thankful for is just to be able to be here with our brothers and sisters and just to be able to share this and that hopefully together since we're just now meeting together, we can be God's redemption in the world. And we look for those spaces. And maybe it's to our family members. And maybe it's to um, the person that we meet out at our works. Whatever it is. But looking for spaces for that we can be God's redemption in the world. And if we still need a little bit of redeeming, it's okay too for us to admit that. Because God cares. And so I'm going to pray for us, and yes.
in the waves of His mercy. As deep cries out.